uh, of OR 2012 before we head into uh, the, the user groups for the rest of this week. Um, to describe what's going to be happening next, we're, we're going to be hearing about the winners of a few of the, the, the competitions that have been taking place uh, during Open Repositories uh, this year. You'll then get a taster of where you could be enjoying the same sort of excitement next year. And then finally, we'll be hearing a, a wrap up of the conference and a thank you to, to those who've made it possible. So I begin, I hope, who here got a chance to go to one of the Pecha Kusha sessions during that? Just about everybody. Great, great. So you, you'll all have got an idea of, of the, the, the variety and the inventiveness and the challenge it presents to people uh, to, to try and get across your ideas in a very fixed format in six minutes and say just enough to get people interested and not so much that you run out of time or space or words uh, or anything else. So for each, it's, it's normal with Pesha Kutcher's to have the idea of, 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 of presenting a prize to, to the best. We couldn't really do that as the best of the whole conference because we didn't have the same audience for each uh, and everyone's working in different conditions. So for each one of the four streams, there's an individual uh, prize being awarded. So I'm going to announce the names now uh, of, of, of the winners. I understand that the, um, the prizes uh, are on their way to us but may not actually be physically present in this auditorium at the exact moment that, that you come forward to, to receive them. So um, consider this an IOU, uh, as it were, from us. So for the first Petra Kusher session, that was session RF1, um, and in the spirit, indeed, of the Kaylee last night, I understand it's, it's gone to a team effort, a pair, uh, indeed, who, who, who danced well, if not dance, dance verbally, approachably. So Theo Andrew uh, and Peter Burnhill. <laughs> Demonstrating their dexterity <laughs> and skill performance. Thank you, I believe the formal photographs and everything, you may leave the stage. Thank you. <laughs> and for the second stream, uh, strand RF3, it's Peter Sefton. <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not compulsory to dance, Peter, but... Uh, I'm performing the Petra, and, uh, sorry, not the Petra, Anna. Oh, right, so there was also a joke. I, I'm, I'm only going what, what's been given here. I've been briefed uh, appallingly, clearly, by whoever it was uh, who, who was doing this. Um, for RF5, uh, the winner was uh, Leah van der Yacht. <laughs> I'm trying to we could just get a photograph of Leah back there. So it's trapped uh, and unable to come down. And finally, Norman Gray for the last session. Norman. Are you with us? <laughs> Norma's usually spotable by the hat, and I can't see the hat anywhere in the, in, in, in the crowd. OK. So from one set of winners, I'm now going to hand over to Mahendra Bahay, who's going to talk to us about the developer challenge. Uh, and we heard the announcement of winners last night. We're going to be hearing a lot more now. OK. Thank you very much. Um, um, so, um, this is the fifth developer challenge that's taken place at Open Repositories. Um, all of them have been supported by JISC, which is the Joint Information Systems Committee, which is funded by the UK government. Um, for the last three years, um, it's been organised by myself, Hendra Mahay, um, and I'm the project manager of a project called DevCSI. Let's bring up the website. I'm going to talk briefly about this. Um, uh, the DevCSI project um, is based at the Innovation Support Centre at UConn at the University of Bath in the UK. And 
I'm just going to just talk a little bit about what the project is about. Um, the project's been running for three years, and it's primarily concerned about creating a community of connected developers working in the UK, uh, in UK academia. And it's about increasing the capacity for technical innovation generally in the sector, hence the innovation bit in the title. Um, the project's aims are about highlighting and providing evidence of the role, value and impact that developers play in technical innovation in universities. And we do this by organizing a number of events where we get developers, domain experts and users to share ideas and expertise. We also con conduct re research which involves surveys, interviews and case studies that try to demonstrate the value and impact that developers bring to our universities in the area of technical innovation. Uh, many developers give up their time for free to share their experiences and even train other developers about new technologies. The project is about getting developers to work horizontally and not just in vertical silos, using technologies in ways that they may not have imagined. Um, we also organize a number of mini projects and challenges. So on to now um, the, uh, the DevCSI challenge at Open Repositories this year. So the challenge this year, if I just bring that up. The challenge this year was fairly vague and generic. Um, it was to show us something new and cool in the world of Open Repositories. Um, First of all, I would like to thank Alex Wade from Microsoft Research for kindly sponsoring the challenge this year. And he'll be up in a, little, in, a, in a minute to announce the Microsoft Technology Prize winner. So this year, uh, there was much more emphasis on implementable, implementable ideas. So you didn't need to be a, a developer or necessarily be a developer to enter. Though we were, we were encouraging people that weren't developers to, to talk to developers about their ideas and seeing if they were technically feasible, if they were too ambitious, etc. So we had a fantastic response, the best ever we've ever had. Um, we had 29 ideas, um, ranging from splinter repositories, mobile apps, repositories that blow bubbles, seriously, okay? <coughs> uh, repositories that blow bubbles when, you, when something is deposited, um, a sword deposit button to put on any website, analytic dashboards, and also what was interesting was possibly an idea for next year, is that many challenges emerged. People put up ideas and wanted to get developers to respond to those ideas. So thank you Rob Sanderson from the Los Alamos Laboratory. Is Rob, Rob here? Um, who put up a sort of a mini challenge. He put up an idea and he, he wanted a developer to bite and, and go with the idea. Did you get anybody to bite yet? Okay. <laughs> There's a, there's a blog posting on our, on our, on our blog about it. Uh, I'll speak to Rob. So uh, now we come to the final decision. So the decisions were actually announced last night at the dinner. And it's time to award the winners their prizes. And also, you're going to get a chance to see what they did. So they're going to redo their pitches. Yesterday, we had, some, we had a developer show and tell session. So they're going to have a bit more time. And there'll be an opportunity to ask a couple of questions as well. Um, I'd like to also thank the judges, um, Peter Sefton, who was the chair, Joss Wynn, um, Bill Anderson, Balvia Note, Ben Ryan, Sarah Shreves, Alex Wade, and the audience who also voted for their favorite idea. And it was done in a very fair and proper way. Uh, alcohol was involved, but, um, but I think it was a fair result. So um, first of all, um, the honorable mentions. Um, and those go to, um, first of all, one entry by Mark Megalivre and Richard Jones, Getting Academics Closer to Repositories, or Sordid. Um, are they here? Okay. And also, another honorable mention, Is This Research Readable? That's Ben Osteen and Cameron Nalen. Okay. So um, if you could just come up for a second, we'll have a, a quick picture of, of you, if you all...
Okay, now I'd like to um, introduce Alex Wade from Microsoft Research, who's going to present the prize for uh, the, the challenge that use Microsoft technology and also the, um, the runners up for the main challenge because they actually won both. Okay. Thank you, Mahendra. Um, so for those of you who weren't there last night, you will get to see a little bit of a demo. And uh, yep, thank you very much. So I just wanted to say a couple uh, comments about this. One of the things that we quite liked about this uh, entry is that it not only showed something that was of general interest to the repository community, something that we saw as, as being feasible to be deployed uh, widely uh, for the sector that, that they're targeting in the scenario, but you guys also sort of embodied a lot of what we'd like to see around these challenges. You came here to open repositories with an idea, you socialized the idea, you refined the idea, you talked with other people and helped flesh it out, which is really nice to see. You also built on some things that I think we had in the challenge last year in Austin and sort of uh, it fleshed that out a little bit more. So I uh, like that on a, on a lot of counts there. So really appreciate it. So I'd like to, uh, for both the runner-up prize and also the, the Microsoft prize, goes to Keith Gilbertson and Linda Newman. Come on up. Your, your prize on the challenge is a, a .NET Gadgeteer kit. It's a uh, rapid prototyping hardware kit. It comes with a, uh, a motherboard, a monitor, a joystick, a camera, a humidity sensor, and if you uh, partner up with Julie Allenson, she'll show you how to make it blow bubbles when people put something in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Now I would like to introduce um, Peter Sefton, who's going to um, announce the, um, the winner of the main challenge. So Patrick's data engine was um, awarded the, the, the main prize because we're sick of Patrick entering the, uh, the competition <laughs> year after year. <laughs> Seriously, uh, data, having data integrated into repositories, processing research data is obviously one of the really hot topics. At the moment, it probably deserves a conference theme all of its own. And uh, this was new and cool. It's, it actually sits alongside lots of other new cool things doing uh, similar things with data processing and visualization. So it'd be really nice to see this further developed um, in concert with other um, efforts in this area, bring some standards in and make it so that we have like sword for, sword for data maybe next time. So the, um, the, 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 the winners and runners-up will share um, a, a, a thousand pounds. It'll be distributed via Amazon vouchers. That's not a plug for Amazon, by the way. Um, and also, the winning entry um, will um, we, we, we've offered to fund the team of one. <laughs> so. Okay, so um, 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 what, we are, what, what we're offering, as, as also apart from the, the cash prize, is two days development time for the team to meet up and actually work on a, on a solution. At the University of Western Sydney. At the U University of Western <laughs> Sydney, well, so. Patrick wants you to go Yeah. Well, if you can get some collaborators together, we can talk about that, okay? So what's going to happen now is the, um, the, the, the runners-up and the, the winner are going to now do their pitch that they gave yesterday. For those of you that didn't see it, they only had three minutes. They can have a bit longer today, okay? And there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions. So over to Linda and Keith first. Can you hear me? Yeah. Has everyone recovered from last night? <laughs> I'm going to start with some uh, use cases, the issues that we're trying to solve with this application. 
In Ohio, we have a network of DSpace repositories, and one of them is the Digital Archive of Literacy Narratives. This particular repository is seeking literacy narratives, which are personal recorded stories of how one le learned to read, write, and compose from everyday citizens. Today, the instructions for uploading MP3s are multi-stepped. Submission from a smartphone with transcripts would be a tremendous boon. This is a youth study for my own institution. We have a poetry collection, and our curator for that collection has been hosting noted poets and making analog recordings for decades, is still doing so using an analog mic and a cassette deck. And I've been working with him to get him into the digital age so that we can up, not have to convert these files from uh, tape to digital files to begin with. It would be great for him to have a method that would not be multi-stepped and would not require multiple devices. Third use study is that we recognize that researchers are using mobile devices in the field. The ability to upload an audio or, or video file at the point of creation with transcript would greatly, we think, enhance the rate of contribution to our repositories. And there's a screenshot here from a project at University of Cincinnati called Portus de Bia, where researchers, archaeologists in this case, are taking um, iPads with them to Pompeii. And if you can see the, make out the photograph, there's someone with an iPad taking notes at an archaeological dig. And we assume making video and audio recordings as well. OK, our um, idea to help with these use cases is called MATS global audio-visual transcription and submission. And we just changed the name about an hour ago from audio to audio-visual, um, because we thought if it works with audio files, why not, why not video files as well? Um, the app, it's a phone app that can record, transcribe, and submit media files. Um, and we based it on a, an app from last year's repository challenge called SwordShare. Um, SwordShare was designed for images to submit those to repositories. Uh, so we took a lot of um, the design from there since we haven't done mobile app development before. We just decided to borrow as much as we could. Um, and this is not an actual screenshot. We've been doing the prototypes um, in Balsamic, um, an application um, to try and figure out how this will work. And this is one of the screens that we took directly from the SwordShare app. But we've already figured out that we're missing something here, because for the transcription part, um, we're going to need some more information, authentication for the transcription applications. OK, here's another. Um, the three functions are record, transcribe, and submit. Um, record, we thought it would be part of the app originally, where you do your recording directly within the application. Um, but now, um, based on what we saw in the SwordShare app, we think that you should be able to record from so any other application and then um, share it from here. So you shouldn't have to record it here. You could use any app to record. Um, the transcription, that's important for repository files because transcription helps with indexing. If you have text for a media file, then the repository can index it. If you just had the audio, then the repository wouldn't be able to do keyword indexing. And it also provides something for people with hearing disabilities to look at, or people who just want to read the file instead of hear it. Like if you're in a meeting and you don't want people to know that you're ignoring them, then you would rather read something than listen to it. Uh, this is the screen where you select a file for transcription. Um, just select a file and then click Continue to go to the next screen. And then where you request the transcription, you enter the metadata here about the file. Um, and there's a media player that you can use to review the file um, to help with your description. And then we have two options for the transcription. Um, the main one, the default one, is this Microsoft Mavis, uh, which I have a slide about in a minute. And also, the backup one is Mechanical Turk. Microsoft. Mavis is computerized indexing. Mechanical Turk is humans. And the reason that you might want to use that is if the audio is very, very poor quality, that a computer couldn't understand it, 
or if it's in um, some, uh, it's in a language that um, isn't supported yet in Mavis. So Mavis is an audio video indexing system. Um, there's a link there to the project page. And it actually is designed to do more than what we're using it for. We're using it um, only to provide text versions of the files. But it can also create video captions for subtitles that you can use in media players. And it's also designed to be used so that um, you have to build this into the repository. But when you search on a keyword, um, instead of just jumping right to the file, you jump not only to the file that the keyword is in, but you jump to the exact spot in the video or the audio file where the keyword is. And there's a company now called Green Button um, that offers a web services API to Mavis. Okay, we have a design problem on this screen because immediately after you uh, request the transcripts, you can submit it to the repository, uh, but the transcripts actually might not be available yet because tran transcribing takes time through these services. Uh, we think that we can resolve that partially with the new SWORD protocol because SWORD protocol can update an item after it's already created. So if you submit it to the repository, the item would be created um, and then it could be updated later when the transcript arrives. So submit to the repository and then the item on the next slide appears um, in the repository. And that's basically the whole idea for our app. We're, um, we want to build this now. We were just pitching an idea before, but we actually want to make it. So we want emails from people who want to know why this, or who know reasons why this won't work or how it could work better, what the design problems are, why we should and shouldn't do it, um, and also any libraries that have experience in mobile development. We would like to hear from you. Okay. Thank you very much. Other Um, we've got time for maybe one question. Okay, so if you are interested in, in what um, Keith and Indra have talked about, um, please uh, um, contact them by their email address. Okay, so um, thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce Patrick McSweeney who's going to do his presentation on the winning entry. Sorry, I'll just offload some ballast. Um, okay, so I thought, is this is actually on? Okay, I thought what I'd do is just do literally slide for slide run through again. How do you transition, is it this? Um, I'll do it for you if you want. No, it's okay. Yeah, just um, yeah, I thought I'd do slide through, run through again, and then I've got a few extra words that I want to tack on at the end. So, if anyone saw yesterday, you have to listen pretty fast, because I'm going to talk really fast. So, this is my friend Dave. Um, Dave generates, uh, during his PhD, was generating a gigabyte of data per experimental run. Um, that was a large amount of data. The university said they weren't actually willing to support him in doing this, so we jury-rigged up some, some sort of solution, which meant that he could refine his... Um, his gigabyte of data down to 10 megabytes of data, which he was then using, visualizing to get a better understanding of the data. Right, so that's the overall workflow. Um, and Dave's backup solution was FTP to a directory, which is then backed up overnight on, a hard, on an external hard disk, which is stored on top of the computer, which Dave was backing up from. And anyone who knows anything about data backing up will realize this isn't a perfect preservation strategy. Um, <laughs> what, what you will also realize is it's a very low effort um, backup strategy. And Dave doesn't know that much about it, right? He's an ele electrical engineer. So it's you guys' job, basically, to, to educate and inform people and build solutions which work for them, even if they're not perfect. Um, so this is something I stole from uh, The Fourth Paradigm, uh, which is a book Microsoft released on is Creative Commons. Go and download it. Um, and it was basically saying that Jim Gray, the guy who wrote the forward or the introduction or whatever it is, um, said this is a problem he sees all the time. Basically, if you're down here, in the long tail of science, where pretty much everybody is, most science down here, right? most data over here, this is your large hadron colliders. Um, the support at this end is very poor. <laughs> there, is, um, there is basically, you've got MATLAB, and you've got Excel, and you've got to get on with it. Uh, and so Dave was having these problems where he had this large data, which he was then refining into small data and visualizing, and he didn't really know which 
Excel came from which large data came, went to which visualization kind of thing. So the whole thing was a bit of a pickle. Um, so the idea is basically to get uh, data imported straight off Dave's experiment, experimental kit into the uh, repository. Now the reason this slide is blank is intentional is because this is the part I haven't implemented. I didn't have any scientific apparatus lying around, but Dave's scientific apparatus, I do have sample files, is just CSVs. So that's all it spits out. Now, for things that don't sit, spit out CSVs, my advice is convert it to CSV. Get everything into one <laughs> format. Make it a format that all your tools, your R, your MATLAB, your Excel, all these tools load CSV. It's like the most basic unit of sharing data. It's not very glamorous. It's not very, very exciting. But it is really useful, and scientists understand it, which is really important. OK, then you take this, which is something that actually exists, um, and you've got a way in your repository to annotate um, the different so you've got, you say what your source data is, hopefully with a URI, um, and you say what scripts you ran, hopefully also with a URI, to convert from the source data into the refined data, and then you could further refine that data if you wanted to. But the important thing is you've then got some tools to do merging and manipulation. So your data, your CSV files, are pushed into a temporary database where you can do SQL processing on them, turn them into smaller and more refined data sets, in the repository still, um, and then from there, you go to the visualization step, also implemented, um, but only for these uh, six visualizations at the moment. Uh, choose a visualization, and then have a look at what your data's like. If you like your visualization, now save that and store that in the repository as well, and we can go from, oh, hang on, what have I got next? Yeah, no. Uh, you can go from the source data, replay the experiment, all the way down to the eventual visualization. Now, the thing, oh, obviously there's potentially lots of visualizations. This is a small sample of the library that I was using, and there are more. Um, the important thing is, not only can you rerun the experiment, which is actually very boring. Um, we almost never rerun experiments unless we, we have a specific use case. What you can actually do is you can take data that looks very similar and throw the data that looks very similar in at the front end, go all the way down your workflow with this new data, doing all your automated refining and stuff, and end up at a visualization at the other end. When you get to that visualization, you're comparing apples and apples because we know that you did exactly the same processes, literally the same, same computational processes on the data to get from the source down to the visualization at the end, which is kind of cool. OK. So as I discussed yesterday, it's been a hectic two days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, and it, it, you know, this is not just a metaphor, it is, well, it is a metaphor, it's a mountain, but we've got to start with the solvable problems, and there are tons in that long tail, there are tons of really easily solvable problems that people are just not stepping up and taking on the challenge. And so, basically, although this is only a transitional step to what some people think, you know, great big semantic science and large hadron colliders and all that sort of stuff, not everyone has a large Hadron Collider, and a lot of people have got really problems right now. Um, so start today, uh, manage, your, manage your researchers' data. Uh, it's good for them, and it's good for you, and that's good for everyone. So that was the talk I gave yesterday. This is me wrapping up. Mahendra asked yesterday when I was drunk if I'd say a few extra words about developer lounge and that kind of thing. Um, I meant what I said. So I said yesterday at the dinner, if you were in the developer lounge um, and you were developing something and you submitted a, you came up and spoke yesterday, I will buy you a beer. I have honored that, but for less than half the entrance so far. So come and find me later. You know, know how to see. Um, <laughs> and, um, yes, 20, 28 ideas. I think this is excellent because the network of communication in that room was like there's loads of people, they're all working on stuff, there's lots of ideas sharing, a brilliant environment to work in. Um, and you see what the power is when you get developers together. The session I'm doing, I'm wearing, wearing the t-shirt appropriately. The ePrints Bazaar session later on today in the ePrints track, come along, is taking, like basically, it's a showcase of developers' little ePrints tools that you can combine and reuse and stuff in interesting ways. And so these kind of ideas are the sort of, I mean, the bazaar itself was an entry in one of these competitions in 2009, and it's a real thing now, and it's literally changing the way we think about repositories. 
or the way I think about repositories anyway. Um, so yeah, developer challenges, massively valuable, really good environment. I'm so glad so many people turned up. Thank you. Um, also, somebody said to me yesterday at the dinner, there aren't that many girls though. And it's true. I can't do anything about that. But there are some girls here who can. We know you're out there. 50% of our user base is female, but only sort of two of our entrants who presented yesterday were female. And I think that's a bit of a problem. Mike, two, three, oh, not enough, not half. Um, so, ladies, I'm asking if you could step up and represent. That would make us all very happy. Um, Dave Mills exists. He's a real person. He's not, just, uh, he's not just for the purpose of this presentation. Dave is my friend and my running buddy. And he really did have this problem. And it's a really huge problem. I mean, over the course of his PhD, he maybe generated, I think we looked at it, I spoke to him by email yesterday. Uh, he reckons he generated... I think it's something like 78, 78 gigabytes of data. Not all of his experiments come out at a gigabyte, but round about that. 78 gigabytes of data is not a lot. You can probably get that on a memory stick if you look really hard. Uh, so, but we've got a lot of researchers. Please, please, please. Your researchers need this so badly. They're just crying out for it. And Dave was crying, and the best we could say, oh yeah, well, hard drive on top of a computer. The solution wasn't perfect but it got the job roughly done. Uh, ben Osteen, Ben Osteen, this, is this research readable.org? This man was very unfortunate in his presentation. He's here every single year. He always puts out absolutely brilliant stuff. And this is online right now. If you haven't seen it, go and see it. Rate a DOI to see how open it is. It's bloody brilliant. Um, and that's it, that's all I got to say. So thank you very much. Patrick, just one quick announcement about um, all the developers who entered the challenge. We're going to do a group photo after uh, all the sessions finish after 1 o'clock. We're going to meet outside, just outside where the library is. So if you could, everybody that entered for the challenge, if you could all meet up at 1 o'clock. So I'm going to now hand over to John. Um, John Eden from Discovery Garden, who's going to be talking about uh, OR13.